holy before, or at least saying it in a church song once or twice. And for most people, this idea is really just connected to being a morally good person. So God is holy because he's morally perfect. Yeah, that is part of it. But in the Bible, the idea of holiness is even bigger and more rich. What it's really describing is how God is the creative force behind the whole universe. He's the one and only being with the power to make a world full of such beauty and life. And so all these abilities, they make God utterly unique, which is the meaning of the word holy. So a helpful way to think about God's holiness is by using the sun as a metaphor. The sun is unique, at least within our solar system, and it's really powerful. It's the source of all this beautiful life on our planet. And so you could say that the sun is holy. And you can actually take this metaphor even further in that the whole area around the sun is also holy. Yeah, because the closer you get to the sun, the more intense it gets. Yeah, exactly. So that very power and goodness that generates all this life is also dangerous. I mean, the sun, if you get too close, will annihilate you. And in the same way, there's this paradox at the heart of God's own holiness, because if you're impure, his presence is dangerous to you. And not because it's bad, but because it's so good. And so the first time we see this paradox of God's holiness, it's in the story of Moses and the burning bush. So God tells Moses to take off his sandals because he's standing on holy ground. And Moses covers his face in fear, and God says, hey, don't come any closer. It's intense. It's actually that intensity of God's holiness that's explored even more in the stories about Israel's temple, which was the main place where God's holy presence was located. And at the center of the temple was this room called the most holy place, this the hot spot of God's presence. And whether you're an Israelite living in the land around the temple or a priest working right in the temple, you're in proximity to God's holy presence, which is dangerous. Yeah. This is a problem. So how's it supposed to work? Well, in the Bible, the solution is that you need to become pure. So like being morally pure. Yeah, and that's easy enough to understand. But the Bible spends a lot of time talking about another kind of purity, being ritually pure, which is a state where you separate yourself from anything related to death, like touching things like diseased skin or dead bodies or even certain bodily fluids. All these make you impure. And becoming ritually impure isn't necessarily sinful. What's wrong is waltzing into God's presence when you're in an impure state. And so that's why God gave the Israelites very clear instructions for knowing when they were impure, steps to become pure, so that they could go into the temple again. So that's what the book of Leviticus is about. Right. But it doesn't stop there. This idea keeps developing. So later in the scriptures, we find this really interesting story by a prophet named Isaiah. And he has this crazy vision where he's in the temple and he's right in God's presence. He's totally terrified. Yeah, he knows the rules. He shouldn't even be in there. And he's worried about being destroyed. And then this crazy creature called a seraphim. Yeah, that is a crazy creature. <laughs> totally. So it flies over with a hot coal, and then it sears Isaiah's lips with the coal and says something really weird. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. So this burning coal somehow makes Isaiah pure. Yeah, it's remarkable. Because normally, if you touch something impure, it transfers its impurity to you. But now here's this new idea where you have this coal, this very holy and pure object, and it touches Isaiah, and it transfers its purity to him. Isaiah is not destroyed by God's holiness. He's transformed by it. I mean, the implications of this are just huge. But there's one more development, this time from another prophet, Ezekiel. And he has this vision where he's standing at the temple, and he sees water trickling out from it. And then that water turns into a stream, and then it grows into a deep river that starts flowing through the desert, leaving this trail of green trees behind it. And then it flows into the Dead Sea, making everything fresh and alive. So instead of becoming pure first and then going into the temple, here God's holiness comes out from the temple, making things pure and bringing them to life. What does it all mean? So we don't know until we meet this man, Jesus. And he claims that he's fulfilling all of these ancient visions, but in surprising new ways. So Jesus, he went around touching people who are impure, people with skin diseases, a, a woman with chronic bleeding or dead people. And when he touches them, their impurity should transfer over to Jesus. But instead, Jesus's purity transfers to them and actually heals their bodies. Jesus is like that holy coal in Isaiah's vision. Right. And Jesus claimed that he was the human embodiment of God's own holiness, and that he and his followers were now God's temple, so that through them, God's holy presence would go out into the world and bring life and healing and hope. And so this is why Jesus described his followers as having streams of living water flowing out of them. So this is our part of the story where we find ourselves now, but where's this all heading? So the last pages of the Bible end with a final vision about God's holiness. And this time it's by a guy named John. And in his vision, we see the whole world made completely new. The entire earth has become God's temple. And Ezekiel's river is there flowing out of God's presence, immersing all of creation, removing all impurity, and bringing everything back to life. We are being renewed every day.
If you are being renewed every day, what does that imply? It implies hope fades. Encouragement wanes. Your bucket leaks. I find that unbelievably encouraging that the Apostle Paul says, i got a secret. And it isn't a secret of how never to need renewal. You can have an experience, don't need renewal anymore. That's not the message. In fact, the message is unbelievably realistic. Day by day, renewed. Which means, every day you leak. Every day you fade. Every day you get depleted. That's what it says. You wouldn't need to be renewed day by day if you could run your car on yesterday's gas. If your metabolism could function on yesterday's meal. If the pain in your head could be relieved on yesterday's dosage. You can't run today's life on yesterday's newness. This is just huge. Those of you who've been Christians a while just know this. You're saying, well, yeah, I know. If you're a new believer, this is one of the most important things you can learn in your life. Because it's so easy to think on the highs that come with Jesus moving into your life is that I've found it, I've risen, I'm, I'm there, I'm flying on eagle's wings. You won't be. <laughs> so, so you got to find ways to put the air under your wings every day. And he says, I I know how to do that. That's the secret I'm after here. I don't want to lose heart. Not a day. I want the secret of being renewed every day. Not a week, not a month. I want every day. I want to figure this out so that I can walk like this. I know life is going to be a battle. That's the implication of renew. So Paul, I really, really want what you say you have. And you say, It takes renewing. This is what Jesus meant when he said in Matthew 6, 34, each day has enough trouble of its own. Don't be anxious about tomorrow because tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient unto the day is its own trouble. Have you ever thought about that phrase? Its own trouble. Like like what is today? Friday? Okay. There's Friday trouble. Guess what? There's Saturday trouble. That's what Jesus said. That's not like me being a prophet. Each day has its trouble. It's appointed. There's going to be Sunday trouble. I'm getting on a plane tomorrow. Maybe the front wheel will fall off. Jesus said so. But you know what else? Lamentations 3 said, sufficient for the day, the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. Those two texts of, I don't know how many years I've been using them for my soul, a lot. Every day has its own trouble. Every day has its own mercies. This is Lamentations 3.21, and this is Matthew 6.34. God has matched them. That's part of the secret. Tomorrow will have its Saturday troubles, and tomorrow will have its Saturday mercies. And those Saturday mercies must be tapped into by the secret here of renewing. Because I had some mercies this morning, and they're not designed for tomorrow. They were designed for today, right now. I'm feeling them now. Tomorrow, there's going to be new, new mercies. And the secret that he's got here is, how do you get under those? How do you get in those? How do you experience those? And I asked God, I said to him, God, is there something in this text that would just give me a clue why did you set it up this way, that I have to be renewed every day? I mean, you, you could have just bumped me up to maximum sanctification and kept me there. <laughs> you know how I know he could? Because he's going to do it when Jesus comes back. I'll never sin again after Jesus comes back. So why am I sinning now? I mean, Lord, just do that. <laughs> you, you're going to do it then? Just do it now. And he says, not the plan. And, and to just go back and borrow the text from this morning... We have this treasure in jars of clay for a reason. Clay that needs to be renewed every day 
clay that can't stand on its own longer than 24 hours or on yesterday's grace for 24 hours so that the surpassing power will belong to God. And you can get in God's face about this and say, I don't like the plan. I don't like the plan that you leave me unsanctified and battling every way, every day with depletion, having to be renewed on grace every day. I don't like the plan. I'd just like to be done with the battle. And he said, well, that's the plan. And the reason it's the plan, I've given you some clues. I'm going to get some glory in your life. If you didn't do it this way, you know what? You'd get uppity about it. You'd think you had it made. You'd think it would start coming from you. The fact that you run out of gas every day puts you in the station. That's me. So God, God has his reasons for why he saves us in stages, sanctifies us slowly, makes us fill up every day at his pump lest we forget where the gas comes from. Become holy. It is about acquiring and living in holiness. And the Bible's quite clear that this is essential to the Christian life. In one place it says it as bluntly as can be, that without holiness no one can see God. The challenge here is that often the language of holiness conjures up for us images of somber people who have a long list of things they do and don't do and who feel they need to impose this list on everyone else. But this is not how the Bible conceives of holiness. The Bible continually describes it as something that God does in us and through us as he claims us for himself and works his holiness out in us. In one place it says it like this, may the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through. In this sense, holiness is an objective characteristic or quality that God imparts to those who belong to Jesus, not a subjective quality that we obtain through moral effort. We are, in one sense, passive recipients of our holiness. And yet at the same time, holiness is, in fact, about a way of life. It is about men and women actively thinking and speaking and living in a way that reflects God's own holiness. In one place, the Bible says we are to present ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. In another place, it says we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Well, these two pictures of holiness, that it is something we passively receive, but also something we actively pursue, can be brought together perhaps if we think about it with the analogy of sympathetic vibration. Because in sympathetic vibration, the sounding note is at just such a frequency that it causes the adjacent object to vibrate spontaneously. And at the same time, there is something about the nature of the object that it will vibrate if it meets a sound wave at the perfect pitch. Our holiness is a matter of our sympathetic vibration, so to speak, with God's own holiness. The sounding note, you might say, is the Holy Spirit. And because this note is indeed a perfect pitch, perfectly conveying to us God's perfect holiness, when it comes into contact with our hearts, passive though they may be, it causes us to begin vibrating in sympathetic harmony with Him. That is to say, our thoughts and words and deeds take on the character and the quality of His thoughts and words and deeds. In this way, we are altogether passive in our sanctification and yet deeply active as we live in harmony with His holiness. Or as the Bible says it, we will be holy because He Himself is holy. Sanctification is the process of growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And it is to grow in holiness, but you grow in holiness by growing in a knowledge of Christ. And so to me, uh, they're tied together. It's not a factual knowledge. It's not just simply knowing scripture and knowing facts. The devils believe God, God is one and that's not sufficient. It's it's an understanding of who God is. It's an embracing who God is for us in Jesus Christ. And when you come to understand who God is for us in Christ and what he has done for us, that knowledge begins to open up a grand picture of who God is, how trustworthy he is, how faithful he is. And as you see him work throughout the throughout as you see him work throughout the history of salvation, you see how trustworthy he has always been. And as you see him work in your life, you see how trustworthy he is. And so sanctification is the process by which you know more and more about who God is for us in Christ, what he has promised to be for us in Christ. And it really is a growing in, a trusting in Christ. So sanctification is the process by where we are growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ to the degree that we're growing in our confidence in ability to trust in Christ. And... Um, the reason Christians fall into sin is because even though we have been born again and even though we are indwelt by the Spirit, there is still the battle between the flesh and the Spirit. And ultimately it is a matter of trust. Will we trust God and be led by the Spirit or will we be led by the flesh and go back to the old ways of thinking? So positionally we are holy, we are sanctified because of the righteousness of Christ, but we are growing in holiness. 
and uh, we still struggle with sin. Sin is still present in this world. Um, death reminds us that sin is still present in this world. The evil around us reminds us that there's still sin present in this world. And the reason that uh, Christians still sin is because we are still battling with sin. And that battle is a battle of faith. And it ultimately comes down to, will we believe God to satisfy us? Will Christ be our satisfaction? Or do we go to the world for it to satisfy us? And um, as Christians, it is a renewing of the mind. I, I, I don't know how other... How, another way to say it, other than it comes down to the fact that as we grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ, it's, as we understand who God is for us in Christ, that uh, by God's grace and by His Spirit, that we will come to trust Him more and more and more. And the enemy knows our weaknesses, and Satan works to get at the very point of our weakness, just like James says in James chapter 1, you know, the reason we sin is because of selfish, unmet desires. And the difference between us and the world is that the unbelieving person is free to meet those selfish, frustrated desires according to the ways of the world. And for us as followers of Christ, uh, the only one that can meet our needs, even frustrated desires, is Christ. And when we have frustrated, unmet desires, um, those desires, James says, uh, turn into sin. Uh, it's rare that you would even hear a young pastor use the word sanctification. It, it basically comes from the idea of being separated, set apart, uh, but it goes back to being set apart from sin. So that sanctification is the progressive disconnect in the life of a believer from sin toward righteousness. So when you become a believer, you have been justified, you have been declared righteous, and then the Spirit of God begins a process of not only declaring you righteous, but making you righteous. And uh, progressively, the Spirit of God works in the believer's life to continually separate that believer from sin. And of course, uh, to make this really operate in a church, it needs to be operating in a leadership. Um, and the goal is to be like Christ, to, to, to conform to Christ. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, there's a wonderful statement where it says, As we gaze at the glory of the Lord, and looking at His glory revealed in Scripture, we are changed into His image from one level of glory to the next. We go from glory to glory to glory toward Christ's likeness. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's sanctification. We're never perfect, but we're progressively we're becoming more like Christ. One day in glory, we'll, we'll be like him. Is God's will for us. The word sanctification is related to the word saint. Both words have to do with holiness. To sanctify something is to set it apart for special use. To sanctify a person is to make him or her holy. Jesus had a lot to say about sanctification. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. And this is before his request. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. In Christian theology, sanctification is a state of separation unto God. All believers enter this state when they are born of God. You are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. The sanctification mentioned in this verse is a once forever separation of believers unto God. It is a work God performs, an intricate part of our salvation and our connection with Christ. This is the first sense of sanctification, which theologians sometimes refer to as positional sanctification. This state of holiness before God is the same as justification. While we are positionally holy, set free from every sin by the blood of Christ, we know that we still sin. That's why the Bible also refers to sanctification as a practical experience of our separation unto God. The second sense, progressive or experiential sanctification, is the effect of obedience to the Word of God in our life. It is the same as growing in the Lord or spiritual maturity, an ongoing work of God in our lives. This type of sanctification is to be pursued by the believer earnestly and is affected by the application of the word. Progressive sanctification focuses on the separation of believers for the purpose for which they are sent into the world. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Jesus set himself apart for God's purpose. That is both the basis and the condition of our being set apart. We are sanctified and sent because Jesus was. Our Lord's sanctification is the pattern of and power for our own. The sending and the sanctifying are inseparable. 
On this account, we are called saints, or sanctified ones. Prior to salvation, we behaved like the world, an example of our separation from God. However, our behavior now should be an example of our standing before God in separation from the world. Little by little, every day, those who are being sanctified are becoming more like Christ. There is a third sense in which the word sanctification is used in Scripture, a complete or ultimate sanctification. This is the same as glorification. Paul prays, May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul speaks of Christ as the hope of glory and links the glorious appearing of Christ to our personal glorification. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This glorified state will be our ultimate separation from sin, a total sanctification in every regard. We know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. To summarize, sanctification is a translation of a Greek word meaning holiness or a separation. In the past, God granted us justification, a once for all positional holiness in Christ. Now God guides us to maturity, a practical progressive holiness. In the future, God will give us glorification, a permanent, ultimate holiness. These three phases of sanctification separate the believer from the penalty of sin, justification, the power of sin, maturity, and the presence of sin, glorification. That answers the question, what is sanctification?